Hello, I'm Marty Chelty. I'm in the Department of Biological Sciences at Columbia University. Green fluorescent protein and other fluorescent proteins are now used quite commonly in biology, particularly cell biology. What I'd like to do in the next few minutes is tell you a little bit about my lab's involvement in the origin of using GFP as a biological marker. I did not start out being interested in developing a new biological marker. Actually, my lab has been interested for many years in mechanosensation, particularly trying to understand the genes that are needed for touch sensitivity. But in the late 1980s, uh, my lab had cloned several genes that were needed for touch sensitivity in the nematode center of Ditis elegans, and we wanted to know where those genes were being expressed. And particularly, we want to know which of our cells, where they in the touch sensing cells. At this time, there were several methods that could and did help us to answer these questions. These included antibody staining, markers such as beta-galactosidase, in situ hybridization. All of these could answer the question, what cells activated what particular gene? But there were problems with these methods. First, they actually required a fair amount of work. We had to prepare the tissues, and that meant killing them, fixing them, permeabilizing them so we could get the antibody or the substrate for beta-galactosidase or the probe for in situ hybridization into the tissue. But the main problem, I think, was the fact that although we could tell at the moment that we prepared the sample that the genes were being expressed there, we couldn't look at more than just this static picture. If we wanted to look over time, we'd have to do preparations for each time point. Then, on April 25, 1989, I heard a seminar that really changed my life. It was a talk being given by Paul Brem, who at the time uh, was a neurobiologist at Tufts University. And in the introduction of his talk, he started talking about the work of this man, Osama Shimomura. And the work he had done in isolating proteins from the jellyfish Aquaria victoria. In the early 1960s, Shimomura had discovered the protein aquarin, which was a bioluminescent protein. It produced light. What he found is that when aquarin and calcium were together, they would produce light. And this was the problem he was trying to address. But he had one slight difficulty, and that was that the light that was produced by this reaction was blue. The jellyfish, however, gave off a light that was green, and he knew there had to be something else. He went back to his protein fractions to look at what was there, and he found that there was another protein that, when added to a corn and calcium, now gave green light. And this protein, he called the green protein, we now call it GFP, or green fluorescent protein. And because I was working on a transparent animal, Center of Dias elegans, I was looking at gene expression. I suddenly realized that this protein, GFP, would make a terrific marker for our experiments. And I spent the whole rest of the seminar fantasizing about this work. I actually don't remember what the rest of the seminar was about. The next day, I got in touch with this man, Douglas Prasher, and found out that he was in the process of cloning the cDNA for GFP from the jellyfish. We had a wonderful conversation, culminating in a decision to collaborate to see whether GFP could be used in other organisms. A few years later, I was lucky enough to get a very talented graduate student under my lab, Gia Skirkin, who came to the lab having just finished a master's degree in chemical engineering working on fluorescence. She came into the lab to do a rotation, and this was the project she was given. We got back in touch with Douglas, who had cloned the gene by this time. He sent this to us, and Gia proceeded to see whether this would work in, at first, E. coli. When she did these experiments, there was hanging over us a problem. And that problem was we weren't really sure it was going to work, because of what was known about the GFP molecule. By this time, investigators had found that GFP had a rather unusual post-translational modification. The peptide backbone in GFP cyclized, and this making of this five-membered ring was a real mystery. 
People speculated it might take one, two, or maybe even more converting enzymes to make the mature protein from the translated product. So it wasn't a sure thing that this was going to work. Nonetheless, Gia did try the experiment, and to our great joy and excitement, it worked very nicely. This is a page from her lab notebook that day, approximately one month after she entered graduate school, where she found strongly fluorescing E. coli and took this picture. She was also lucky in another sense, and that is how we did the particular experiment. Douglas's clone had a, a cDNA from the jellyfish that was really the coding sequence, which I've diagrammed here in green, and non-coding sequence, which is in red. He had gotten this as an equal R1 re uh, restriction fragment. Now, we could have simply taken that restriction fragment and used that in our experiments, but I decided I didn't want the extra stuff and that it would be better to use PCR to amplify just the coding region. I wasn't sure what the rest was going to be, but this turned out to be a very lucky choice because it turns out that at least three other labs that I know of tried the experiment but used the EKR1 fragment. And when they did that, they never got any fluorescence. So there was something in these extra sequences that seemed to interfere with the production of a fluorescent protein. We didn't do that. We didn't have that problem. Within one month, we knew that this was going to work. We were very excited. Now meant we had to do, uh, we were going to go off and do many other things. We put this in worms and decided that this was time now to publish the material. We had a little bit of difficulty with publishing the paper. So we sent the paper in to be re uh, reviewed uh, in science. And the first thing we found was that the editors were not going to send it out to reviewers uh, for consideration because they did not like the title. The original title was Green Fluorescent Protein, a new marker for gene expression. And the editors told me that all the papers in the journal were new and novel, and so we couldn't use new in the title, and would I change the title? I was a little bit miffed at this, and so uh, in retaliation, the title I gave them was considerably longer. The Aquaria Victoria Green Fluorescent Protein needs no exogenously added component to produce a fluorescent product in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. This is essentially the entire paper. Paper got reviewed, the reviewers liked it, and then the copy editor got in touch with me and said, you know, your title is a little long. Could you possibly shorten it? And I said, I think I can do that. And I changed it so the final title is Green Fluorescent Protein as a marker for gene expression. This was not the end of our troubles, though. We had sent in this picture that you see here that eventually made it to the cover of Science. And I was very proud of this picture because what it shows is a growing nerve cell in a living larva of the animal. And I wanted to point out the fact that GFB could be used in living tissue. The art editor, cover editor, called me up and said that they really liked the picture, they wanted to use it on the cover, but there was one problem. And that problem was that they never liked to use the color green on the cover, and would I consider changing the color of the picture? I said, no, I really wanted it to be green, and fortunately, they kept it that way. The final problem we had in publication was by this time we had already given out samples of the plasmid to people to try for themselves and we were getting wonderful reports back from people saying that it had worked. So I wanted to put that as personal communication into our paper and the people that we asked were all uniformly very generous and allowed us to do this. One person, however, asked for some additional uh, considerations. Specifically, and you probably can't read it in this, in this letter, but the letter asks that I prepare coffee every Saturday morning for two months, prepare a special French dinner, and take out the garbage nightly for a month. These were requirements set by my wife, Tula Hazelrig. But I really wanted to use her work, and although we still debate about whether I actually have paid up on this, uh, the work she did was really wonderful and was published a few months later because she's the person that made the first protein fusion with GFB. So she was able to show that GFB could be linked to other proteins and that meant one could follow those other proteins, check their localization, but also see their movements within cells and tissues. 
A beautiful example of the use of GFP protein fusions can be seen in this movie by Rosalind Silverman Gavrilla of the nuclear divisions in an embryo of Drosophila. I've taken this from the cell image library of the American Society for Cell Biology. It's on their website. It's a really beautiful picture showing uh, in this time-lapse film cell division in which you can see the spindle label, you can see the spindle forming and then dissolving and forming once again. GFP, other fluorescent proteins and their derivatives have been used for thousands upon thousands of experiments throughout biology. Their small size and inheritability provide a dynamic and essentially non-invasive means of following biological processes in living cells. We've already learned much and will continue to learn more by using these molecules in the future. I want to close with some more general lessons that I take from the story of the development of GFP. First, many discoveries are accidental. Certainly the discovery of GFP is one of those cases. Shimomura was not looking for a fluorescent protein, he was looking for a bioluminescent protein, but his experiments led him to this rather wonderful molecule. Second, scientific progress is cumulative. It's not the product of just Shimomura or myself or Douglas Prasher or Tula Hazelrig or many other people, Roger Chen, who developed the first molecules with different uh, emission colors, who also developed the first FRET-based molecular monitors using the fluorescence proteins, or the Lukianos and Mikhail Matz, who discovered the first red fluorescent protein by looking at corals. And really, the thousands of people that have added to the usefulness of GFP. Third, I think this is a good example of saying that all life should be discovered. We should not simply be working with model organisms. I think we now can be all very grateful that Shimomura was interested in a fundamental biological question that had nothing to do with human biology or human health, how it is that some organisms can produce light. And it was that curiosity that led him to work on the jellyfish and then led him to discover GFP. And finally, the GFP story is a good example of how essential basic research is. When Shimomura discovered GFP, I don't think anyone would have imagined the usefulness it would have for other discoveries in basic research throughout the biological sciences or for investigations into human health that's been used to study HIV, AIDS, inherited diseases, or that it would be useful in biotechnology. The usefulness comes from other people and what they've done, but it all starts with that basic research that was so necessary. And so what I want to do is close with one of my favorite quotes about basic research. It comes from Robert R. Wilson, who is the physicist that was the first head of the Fermi Labs, the particle accelerator in Batavia, Illinois. He was asked in 1969 to go before a congressional committee to justify why they should pay for this rather enormous science experiment. He was asked many times to try to describe the security benefits, the benefits for national defense that would come from this accelerator, from what was going to be learned there. And every time he was asked, he said no. And then he finally said that the accelerator had only to do with the respect with which we regard one another, the dignity of men, our love of culture. It has to do with whether we are good painters, good sculptors, great poets. I mean all the things we really venerate in our country and are patriotic about. It has nothing to do directly with defending the country except to make it worth defending. Thank you.